Welcome to our study this week of Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 20. My name is Scott Rainey. I serve with the Church of the Nazarene in the area of Nazarene Discipleship International, or NDI. This adult Sunday school video lesson is provided in collaboration between the Foundry Publishing and NDI. The Sunday school lesson is intended to support the local church's efforts to make disciples who make disciples. Please feel free to use this video in any way that helps your church and its families. In recent weeks, we've been following the ministry of Paul as described in the book of Acts. At the end of Acts chapter 18, there is a lot of movement from town to town for Paul and his companions. Paul, with Priscilla and Aquila, went from Corinth to Syria in Acts chapter 18, verse 18. Then Paul, Priscilla, and Aquila went on to Ephesus for a very short time, according to Acts chapter 18, verses 19 to 21. Leaving Priscilla and Aquila in Ephesus, Paul went to Caesarea and then to Antioch in verse 22. Acts chapter 18, verse 23 says that Paul went from place to place throughout the region of Galatia and Phrygia. As we look at Acts chapter 18, we must recognize that God's church is on the move. Christ never intended his church to be stagnant, to stand still. He has called us to always go where the church is not yet. In Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, Jesus shares the great commission with his disciples. Christ's command says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. The church of Jesus Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit, is always on the move with the good news of God to the world. There's one final movement in, as Acts chapter 19 begins. Paul travels back to the city of Ephesus. He had already been there once, but only for a short time. Ephesus was the fourth largest city in the Roman Empire. It was a prosperous port city on the eastern shore of the Aegean Sea in Asia Minor, what is modern-day Turkey. Ephesus was famous for its temple, one of the great seven great wonders of the world that was dedicated to the goddess Artemis, a fertility god. Ephesus was also known as a center for magical arts, which, we will, which will come back to play in the end of our story today. According to Acts chapter 18, verse 24, a Jewish man named Apollos had been in Ephesus. Apollos was a native of Alexandria. He was an educated man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. Acts chapter 18, verse 25 says, Apollos had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he knew only the baptism of John. What does this mean? He knew only the baptism of John. To answer this question, we need to back up to the time just before Jesus started his earthly ministry. Before Jesus' ministry began, John the Baptist had prepared the way for the Lord by calling people to repentance through baptism. But John knew full well that there was one coming after him that was more powerful than he was. Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, records John's own words. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Note the two baptisms mentioned in Matthew chapter 3. A baptism with fire, I'm sorry, a baptism with water for repentance, that's John's baptism, and a baptism with the Holy Spirit and fire, that's Jesus' baptism. Apollos only knew John's baptism. As I mentioned earlier, Paul, Priscilla, and Aquila traveled to Ephesus in Acts 18, verse 19. Paul only stayed for a short time and then left, leaving Priscilla and Aquila behind. Soon, Priscilla and Aquila met Apollos 
as they shared the gospel at Ephesus. Apollos accepted the good news of Jesus and was taught the way of God more adequately, according to verse 26 of Acts chapter 18. Apollos was a gifted witness and apologist. He moved uh, on to the city of Corinth while the apostle Paul returned to Ephesus. And let's begin there with Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 20. While Apollos was at, at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived in Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly mal uh, maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and the Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon possessed. They would say, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day, the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I know about, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and empowered them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. When Paul entered the city of Ephesus, he met a group of men, about 12 of them, according to Acts chapter 19, verse 7, who Luke, the author of the book of Acts, calls disciples in verse 1. Although the word disciples is usually referred in the New Testament for followers of Jesus, here, it seems a decide, to describe a group of people who were convicted of their sin and who had been baptized under the teaching of John the Baptist or possibly one of the followers. These men were very similar to Apollos in their biblical understanding. It is possible that these men had even sat under the teaching of Apollos, for they, like Apollos, only knew the baptism of John. Paul's first question to these disciples was, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Acts chapter 19, verse 2. Theologically, we know through the fullness of Scripture that when someone believes on the Lord Jesus, he or she receives the Holy Spirit. 
we say this person was saved, born again, or initially sanctified. After Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, verse 38, records Peter saying, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But these disciples of John the Baptist acknowledged that they had not even heard that there was a Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 19, verse 2. Their response likely reflects their lack of awareness about the Holy Spirit's coming at Pentecost. They had only received John's baptism of repentance. When Paul heard this, he baptized them in the name of the Lord Jesus, according to verse 5. Paul then placed his hands on them in verse 6. The Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. I'd like to mention just a few things at this point. First, the book of Acts is very strong on the teaching that salvation is in Christ alone and that believers need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. However, the book of Acts is not the best book in the New Testament for understanding a theology of sanctification or entire sanctification for that matter. Paul's letters to the churches have much more to teach us about the doctrine of sanctification than does the book of Acts. So it would not be productive for us to take this passage and argue when these disciples were saved or, or when they were entirely sanctified based on the historical account of Acts chapter 19. Second, what is very clear in Acts 19 is the intentionality that the Apostle Paul had to ensure that every believer was filled with the Holy Spirit. The first thing Paul asked these disciples was when he met them was, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? This holy desire for all believers to be filled with the Spirit has been a part of the Church of the Nazarene's DNA throughout the years. This desire must continue in every church and in every home. Dads and moms, grandpas and grandmas, pastors and lay leaders, we must continue to desire to see our children, our teens, every new Christian, every believer come to a place of full surrender of their lives to God, receiving the fullness of the Spirit to be set apart for all God has for us. Third, Acts chapter 19, verse 5, is the only reference to rebaptism in the New Testament. The question of baptizing someone a second time has been a hot topic for centuries. This passage gives us one example of people who were baptized without full understanding, who later are baptized again when they come to fully believe and receive the good news. Fourth, the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of believers enables them to preach and proclaim the good news of salvation to all people. In verse 6, we learn that when the Holy Spirit came on these men, they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Just like on the day of Pentecost recorded in Acts chapter 2, these believers were empowered by the Holy Spirit to proclaim the good news to all people everywhere in word and in power. Today, we also need the infilling of the Spirit if we are to share the gospel effectively and live a Christ-like life, making Christ-like disciples in the nations. Just as the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost inaugurated the Christian mission in the book of Acts, and the giving of the Spirit in Cornelius' house reiterated that mission among the Gentiles, the Ephesians event recorded in Acts 19 extended that mission to the rest of the Roman Empire. It's interesting that Ephesus is the last place where Paul took the gospel. Some have su suggested that this group of 12 men in Acts 19 might provide the opposite bookend to the 12 apostles, whose mission was to take the gospel into the entire world. Paul's ministry in Ephesus does not end with these 12 men, however. The gospel spread throughout the entire area. 
Paul, when in a new city, often started his ministry in the Jewish synagogue. This was certainly the case in the city of Ephesus. For three months, we're told in verse 8 of Acts chapter 19, that Paul spoke boldly, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. The words arguing persuasively can literally be translated from the Greek as entering into dialogue persuasively. In the power of the Holy Spirit, Paul was bold and never walked away from a good discussion about the salvation of the world through Jesus as the risen Christ. Eventually, a group of Jewish opponents hardened their hearts against Paul's message. When they began to slander the gospel publicly, Paul simply left the synagogue and began to teach and preach in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This lecture hall was most likely a place where students and teachers met and where philosophers lectured. This move extended Paul's influence beyond the limitations of the sanctuary, of the synagogue. This is a good reminder that our witness, our sharing of the gospel, should always extend beyond the four walls of our churches. Paul was able to continue his ministry in Ephesus for two full years, spreading the gospel message to both Jews and Greeks throughout the province of Asia. This two-year period became Paul's longest tenure of ministry in any of the churches that he planted. Luke records a rather humorous contrast between the authentic power of God at work in Paul and the ineffective power and disastrous results of the seven brothers who tried to fake authority over evil spirits in the name of Jesus. God affirmed Paul's ministry with miraculous signs and the power to expel evil spirits in Jesus' name. God's power was so intensely at work in Paul that people found healing by merely touching clothing that Paul had touched, according to Acts chapter 19, verse 12. Some people of the town must have wondered if there was some magic in the name of Jesus. Without knowing God personally, they simply tried to repeat what they had seen through the ministry of Paul. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest invoked the name of Jesus like a magical formula. They commanded an evil spirit to come out. It did not turn out the way they expected, to say the least. The spirit they tried to cast out completely mastered them, humiliated them, and defeated them. Rather than driving out the evil spirit, the man with the spirit drove them out from the house in an unforgettable way. Our, star, our story makes the power of Jesus undeniable. But Jesus' power is experienced in a relationship of faith and obedience to him, not in merely saying his name like some magical formula. News of these contrasting events spread quickly. The people were seized with fear or reverent awe due to the power associated with Jesus as Lord. Their reverent awe brought the people to a position of praising Jesus, honoring his name in Acts chapter 19, verse 17. The effect of the gospel was not just intellectual assent, though. Transformation of the lives and practices of the people became evident to everyone. Some of the believers renounced their magical practices. The verb confessed was associated with a confession of sin. The believers obviously became convicted of the incompatibility of magical practices with Christian faith and life. This open repentance brought accountability to the faith community and rendered those secret, secretive magical practices ineffective. Please know that when people come to Christ in true repentance today, life transformation always follows because the Spirit of God now lives inside the new believer. Jesus calls us in the power of the Holy Spirit to live a new way, his way. The believers even brought their books of magical arts to the public square 
and burn them there. The cost of the books was said to be 50,000 drachmas, according to Acts 19.19. 19. According to scholars, that is more than someone might make if they work for 165 years, or a general sum of three to five million dollars today. What a witness that this was to the world around them. As a result of all this, the word of God spread widely, and the gospel grew in power, according to Acts chapter 19, verse 20. As is typical in the book of Acts, and still true for today, the gospel of Jesus Christ prevails, and no opposition can stop it.